this morning. Thank you so much for having me back. Appreciate that. Uh, you have been in our prayers ever since we got to know you. The search for a pastor is always a daunting challenge. It's probably the biggest leap of faith any church can do in its history. Because when you call a pastor, you really don't know what you're getting in until about six months in. And he doesn't have a clue what he's getting until he's about six months <laughs> That's right. So it is a big leap of faith. So I commend you for that and pray for you in the process. Uh, I also want to say how much I appreciate uh, patriotic uh, the song uh, and then the the story about the flag. I love that story. Uh, it has so, so many wonderful symbols in it about the sacrifice that people have for holding and believing in that flag. And I want to share with you, if you don't, if you haven't heard, we recently had another battle of the flag, whether or not it stands. On the University of North Carolina, about three months ago, there was a Palestinian protest that took place on campus. And the protesters took down the flag and raised the Palestinian flag. You remember that story? You remember seeing that? And uh, I got to say, fraternities usually get a bad rap at college, but this fraternity took it upon themselves to take down that Palestinian flag and raised back up the American flag and held it where it wouldn't hit the ground. And one young student said, my father fought for this flag and I will die before I let somebody take it down. Amen. Now that's a, that's a great modern story as well as the one that Francis Scott Key witnessed. And I don't know if it was planned this way in your service or this the Holy Spirit just kind of took over but after we did the pledge and sang the uh, national anthem, the very next song that we sang, remember what it was? The Old Rugged Cross. And it's the standing of the Old Rugged Cross that makes it possible for this flag to stand. That's so right, we're, amen. We'll stand without it. So we are very, very grateful for our country to be able to worship here and drink and just acknowledge what God has done in our country. We're living in some very troubled times. Right. We're going to talk about that today. And before I do, I want to, I've asked for permission. I've written four books. I brought two of them today. Um, when I was pastoring, uh, I had a sweet young lady, they had two small children, will come out every Sunday and say, Brother Ronnie, I just love your sermons. He said, I get them, I get the CD every week. I said, I play them at night and my kids go right to sleep. <laughs> and then she just walked out the door. I thought, wow. <laughs> so anyway, I've written four books. I have two of them here. So if you need some good bedtime sleep book, you can read this one. But this one is um, one that we're, we have familiarity with, grief, grief that won't go away. I've written about stories of men and women in my ministry who have experienced great grief. Some of you have too, it's there. And then I've written this one, Becoming Christ-like, uh, Discovering the Essence of Jesus. Uh, the paperbacks were $10, uh, the hard copies are 15 if you don't have $10 that needs sleep at night, you can pick one up for free as long as you read and share it with somebody else, all right? We'll do that. So uh, so if you have that, you want one, they're available there. Thank you uh, for letting me uh, display those. They are, they're on the table outside there. So the, um, take your Bibles and turn to Acts, the second chapter. The thing I want to do today, I really want to encourage us because we're, I never thought I would live to see the kind of times that we're in right now. Uh, in all the times of my growing up, I, I grew up, of course, in the 60s where there were uh, riots on campus because of the Vietnam War. I, I grew up 
as many of you did during the the, uh, the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, all of these. We grew up in some very troublesome times. But in my mind, what we're experiencing now is far worse That's in right. many respects. I never grew up in a time where I saw protesters demanding the beheading of college professors or representatives in our Congress. I never grew up in a time where there was where I ever would have thought that there would be demonstrations that would be so anti-Semitic that and hatred for Israel would start coming up. It just reminds me of the things that I read about during World War II in Germany, and we're seeing some of those very things take place. It's very disturbing. And so, but then every once in a while, the Lord brings to my mind reasons not to be discouraged. And the primary reason that he tells us not to be discouraged in these troublesome times is because of his involvement in these times. Amen. You see, God did not, Jesus did not rise from the dead and ascend into heaven and to sit passively on his throne as, and he watches us go through all of these things. He doesn't do that. The Bible is very clear that Jesus is, is very active, very active in all of the events that are taking place. And we've been fortunate enough over the past year or two to be able to see where God has become involved, where God uh, shows up uh, in uh, so many different places. Uh, one of my Actually, my favorite philosopher of all times uh, is Forrest Gump. Y'all remember that movie? He came up with some of the most brilliant sayings of all. You know, after seeing some of the accidents happening with fireworks, I thought about the phrase, you can't fix stupid, you know. <laughs> then I thought about life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you get. But my favorite one, was of a scene that took place whenever Horace was out on his shrimp boat in the middle of the Gulf. And on his boat was Lieutenant Dan, who was so angry and mad because he survived. Some Horace saved his life, he didn't want that. He was mad at life, he was mad at God. And on that scene, he's on the mast and he's screaming at God. And He's saying, if you're real, show yourself, and just making and complaining about that. And right at the time he said that, Horace made these, this statement, you remember it? And God showed up with a hurricane. God showed up. I love that statement because I want to show you today how God is showing up and doing some remarkable things that maybe are not being reported on, but they're very real and very exciting. But in Acts chapter 2, I want to point out one time that God showed up. It was on the day of Pentecost. It said, when the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly there came from heaven the sound of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared on them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in their own language. And they were amazed and they were astonished and saying, Are not these Galileans who were speaking? How is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, res residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Persia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians who hear them telling them in our own language the mighty works of God. And they were all amazed and perplexed, saying, what does this mean? And they, others mockingly said, well, these are, they're drunk, they're filled with new wine. 
But Peter stood with the eleven, lifted up his voice, and addressed them. He said, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declares, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see vision, your old men will dream dreams. I will pour out my spirit. That's when it, that's when it all started. And ever since that time, as God poured out his spirit upon those who were there, those who had who became believers in Jesus, who received the Holy Spirit into their life. Ever since that time, God has been doing some remarkable things. That's right. We see them in Scripture, and I think sometimes we see them today, but we don't recognize that this is what God is doing. These, this past year has been extremely difficult for us, the college campuses are on fire from protesters and supporting Palestinians in the current Israeli war going on. People are being hurt. Horrible language is being expressed. Threats are being made. School buildings are being vandalized. Churches are being vandalized. People are being attacked because of their ethnic or racial heritage. We're facing this kind of hatred among college students that are taking place in our campus. Not only that, but we have other issues that are causing problems. We have an immigration crisis that's threatening the very fabric of some of our communities today. Laws are being broken and are not being prosecuted. People, young women, are being killed. Prosecutors refuse to prosecute some levels of crime and Reduce, reduce funding for police. There's all these kind of things that are happening. Social unrest, criminal behavior has kind of brought a sense of hopelessness. What, what can we do? What, so the question is, what can we do? Here we are in, in Bayer, and all these things are going on around the world. So what can we do. So let's talk about that. I think the first thing that we can do is to remember that you and I are not here by accident. That's right. We are here by the very purpose of God to make a difference in our community. Amen. We're here with a purpose. So we're not here by mistake. And if you read through church history, you'll find that in every generation, there has always been some kind of crisis, and right in the middle of the crisis was the church. Right in the middle of the persecution under Rome was the church. Right in the middle of the, the dark days of, of uh, the, uh, uh, the killing of Christians by uh, the Catholic Church was the true church right in there. Right at the time in England when it was against the law to, to, write the, to translate the Bible into English, there was the church. Right in the time when America was being founded, there was the church. So you see, in every generation, whenever there has been a crisis, whenever there has been something that has been disturbing, or something that's happening in society, or in politics, or in a world war, we find that God has put us in the midst of that because he puts us here because, guess what? We're the only one that has the answer to the problem. Nobody else has the answer. All the other answers that are being bowed around out there are not answers at all, but they're just really creating more problems for the community, for society, for college campuses, for politicians and everywhere. So God put you and me here to be a witness for him and to share the wonderful truth that Jesus Christ is alive and he's present. He's alive and he knows what's going on. Not only does he know what's going on in society and in politics and on college campuses, but he knows what's going on in my household. 
He knows what's going on in your house, the struggles that you might be having, either physically or economically, or family, or parenting, or any of those things. He's very much aware. And just as he is, was active on the day of Pentecost by sending the Holy Spirit there on that where thousands of people got saved, he's very active in your house. He is present with you as you face the normal daily difficulties and, and the challenges of life. He is present with our children whenever they go to school. He's present on Capitol Hill, even though we might not think he's doing very much, but he's present on Capitol Hill. He's present with the politicians. He is there doing great things. He's, so, and we're here because people are hurting, people are struggling, people have questions, and so we're put here to provide answers to those questions that are being asked. We're put here to provide an answer to those that, are, that just don't have any hope, that are afraid. On the time that, uh, on the day of Pentecost when the church was born, the Bible says the Holy Spirit came, and he, when he came, everything changed. So you see, when God shows up, nothing remains the same. When God shows up, he does some remarkable work. And on that day, 3,000 people were saved. Amen. On another day, there were 4,000 people saved. And all of a sudden, those 3,000 and 4,000 people began to scatter all around. We think about the 12 disciples going on all over the world. Well, there were 3,000 people who went home who had Jesus in their hearts. So revival began to spread all across the world through the testimony of those new converted believers under the leadership of the apostles. So the message of the day of Pentecost is that Jesus is alive, he's active in our life, and so the God who showed up on the day of Pentecost has been showing up all through history. Amen. All through history. Think about it. God showed up in a burning bush to get Moses' attention so he could go up there to find out what was happening and God spoke to him and in that moment history changed for the Jewish people. They were in captivity. They were in Egypt. They had been there 400 years. They had lost hope. They were, in, they were being severely persecuted in all kinds of ways by Pharaoh. And so God shows up in a burning bush and he says, Moses, i got a job for you to do. You go back and leave those people out of Egypt. Of course, God, Moses didn't, didn't want to do that, but God won the argument. God usually does win the argument. That's right. We might say no for a while. We might say, I'm not going to do that for a while. But God is a great parent. He knows how to make our life miserable until we get it right. Yeah. He does that. So he showed up to the burning bush. And then whenever it came time to, for the children of Israel to leave Egypt, they were, they were being, being led out of Egypt by Moses and leading them through the desert. They came to the Red Sea. Pharaoh decided to change his mind and come after them and take them back home. And, uh, or to kill many of them. And so here they were trapped between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's arm and they started crying. And they had just witnessed some of the greatest miracles of God to the plagues of Egypt. But here they were crying and, and complaining and, and Moses lifted up his voice to the, to the Lord and, and remember what the Lord said to him. He said, why in the world are you standing here talking to me? Lift your staff and watch what happens. Right. So Moses raised his staff, Red Sea opened up, children of Israel marched through on dry ground, Pharaoh followed behind, all of his army died, God showed up at the Red Sea and gave a pathway through the problem. God showed up in the fiery furnace, three Hebrew children, remember that story? There they were, being burned alive because they wouldn't do with the king wanted them to do in their worship, so he threw them in the fiery furnace, and he looked in there, and he said, hmm, I thought we took three men in there. I see four. And the fourth one looks as the faith of the Son of God. God showed up in the fire. So if you find yourself in fiery times, that's just right at the opportunity that God shows up and gives you a sense of his presence. Amen. And he says, you're going to be okay. That's right. I'm going to be with you right here. God showed up in the lion's den with Daniel. God showed up in Bethlehem in the form of a baby. He showed up on Calvary to save us from our sins. These are just 
biblical examples of God showing up, but but you know, we have to we have to understand God didn't stop showing up when the Bible stopped being written. God still showing up Amen. in remarkable Amen. kinds of ways, and we have witnessed some of those remarkable ways just recently with all the things that are happening. He showed up in in Minnesota at the place where George Floyd was killed. Y'all remember that? It's a horrible story. George Floyd was killed by a police officer and had his, neck, had his knee on his neck and died there. And in the aftermath of that senseless death, there began to be riots and burnings and, and uh, all kinds of, of uh, destruction of property, theft and all those things. And, and, uh, and this, was, this was going on. And in the midst of that, there were two pastors who started praying. They said, Lord, help us make a difference in this burning community. Help us make a difference in the riots. And so they prayed and they prayed and they felt the leadership of God saying, we need to go down to the community where this is happening. And so these two men, these two pastors showed up and they began to talk to people. They began to pray with them. And pretty soon, two turned into 10. 10 turned into a hundred, a hundred turned into 200 as those men set up a place of worship just a few blocks away from where George Floyd was killed. And in those, in that place where there was where people were coming forward, accepting Christ as their savior, they moved to a horse trough out there where people could be uh, baptized for their belief in Christ. Lives were being changed. People were being filled with a joy, thinking we have hope now because God showed up in Minneapolis where George Floyd was killed. And the move of God lasted for weeks down there. Christian Broadcasting Network came and reports that non-believers were coming together and finding the presence of God in that place where all around them were National Guard. All around them there were fires burning. Stores were being vandalized. And all around that, in the middle of all of that, was a place where people found peace with the presence of God. God was in the midst of the fire Amen. there in Minneapolis. And then we find that, that that being said, that there are a lot of wonderful things that were happening that those pastors continued to do. They follow uh, the leadership of God. It's not too long after that. God showed up in San Diego, California. After weeks of rioting, weeks of vandalism and destruction, 135 churches joined together to pray for the city. 16,000 men and women lined the streets in San Diego, California to pray. They met in different locations to come before the throne of grace to bring peace to the city. I shared this experience in one of the churches where I, where I preached at, when I filled the pulpit one day. And after the service was over, there was a lady that came up to me and she said, Brother Ronnie, I just want you to know I was in that 16,000 people in San Diego. She said it was a remarkable experience of sensing the presence of God. Said we would gather in the mornings, there would be blood on the sidewalks, there would be broken windows and stores and banks, there would be all kinds of, of uh, just um, sticks and boards and all kinds of weapons, but we walked on those streets, we gathered, we circled up, and we prayed, and God began to make a move among those people, those store owners, those business owners who had been vandalized. Many of them came to find hope through those prayer events that we had in San Diego. God showed up on the sidewalk in San Diego, California. In Chula Vista, 13,000 people lined the streets to pray for revival in the city. Not too long after that, a group of pastors met every day in the Occupy Zone in Seattle. Remember that? Where they had the Occupy Zone, police couldn't get in there, but guess what? God could. Pastors showed up, many of those young people, some of them belonging to Antifa, some of them belonging to just rebellious groups, came and talked to the pastors. 
They told them about Jesus. Many of those young men and women left the occupied zone and entered into the kingdom of heaven. God showed up there in Seattle. And God is also showing up on college campuses today. We're living in a time of crisis and campuses are on fire with protests and violence and discrimination and attacks on Jewish students. And these protests have spread, moved from Columbia University where they started, they moved all across campuses in the country where protesters and Palestinian protesters are, are taking charge of campuses, setting up tents, cities and campuses, and holding staff hostage and, and uh, vandalizing buildings and libraries. And in the midst of all that, God is showing up. See, we read about the crisis, we read about the fire and the evangelism, but we don't read about what's going on, what God is doing in those behind the scene moments. In the midst of this dark time, God is bringing light and hope on college campuses today. On February the 8th, 2023, on a small campus named Asbury, God showed up. On a regular chapel service, turned into a non-stop prayer service that lasted over two and a half weeks. And it was reported that the service was, when the, the regular chapel service was over with, nothing unusual happened, except a few students stayed behind in the chapel, and they had their guitars, and they were singing and praying, and they began to share their testimonies, and all of a sudden, more students would come in, more students would come in, until it wasn't very long until the entire chapel was filled with students who were praying and singing and experiencing the presence of God. Young people who were away from Christ came into that chapel service and felt his presence and rededicated and recommitted their life to Jesus. Amen. Those who were agnostic and atheist going to this small college campus came to find out that, that their atheism was just, just nothing because they found out that the one they didn't believe in really was alive. Amen. And he was present there in the Asbury campus. He showed up. Thousands of people came from all over the country in that two-week period of time just to experience something of the presence of God in the revival service that was taking place. Students, whenever it started, started running through the campus and saying, God showed up. Revival is here. Come join us. And soon the auditorium was filled there was no preaching, there was simply singing, there was praying, there was testifying, but you could sense and feel the presence of God. People who came from all over the country to see what was going on, many came with some kind of, of uh, they weren't real sure about it, but they came out of curiosity. And when they entered that auditorium, they found out that the presence of God was very real and it affected their lives in such a way that they went home changed. Amen. Several students came Several students came from other universities just to see what was going on. Some students came from Auburn University to ask her to see what was happening. They came back literally filled with the spirit. They came to, and they, they literally packed Neville Arena on Auburn campus for worship and praise. And after the worship service was over with, Several young people said, stood up and shouted, I accepted Christ, I need to be baptized. I want to know people to know that I'm a Christian. All of a sudden, another student and another student, and finally over 200 students stood up in that auditorium saying, I have accepted Christ, I want to follow him in baptism. And so all of those students just flowed out of that auditorium to a fountain that was on in the center of Auburn University campus. There were so many students that needed to be baptized and accepted Christ that the brand new, the brand new head football coach was baptizing them along with other spiritual leaders on that Auburn campus. And one, one man who heard about it and came and said, said, I've been an Auburn fan all my life. My children are going here. I've seen some pretty incredible things. I've seen Auburn defeat Alabama in football game. I've seen them win national title. I've seen them beat 
other great universities, but he said, I've never seen anything like this. Amen. Never seen anything like this. God was moving on that campus there at Auburn University. New people, new young people came to know Christ as their personal Savior. And then there was a revival that, that started up on Western Kentucky University, a small college campus of the University of Bowling Green. And some students attended some of the other services at Esther and the other campuses, and they, they were so excited about what they saw and what they experienced, they, they drove home to their campus on, on Western Kentucky University, and they got home at 4 o'clock in the morning, and they said, let's go pray. It was 25 degrees, and 30 students showed up to pray for revival on Western Kentucky University, 4 o'clock in the morning. And then we find that several hundred students confessed their faith in Christ. God showed up on that small campus. Said the worship service was described as worshipful, musical, orderly, respectful, hopeful, prayerful, God honoring and glorifying. More than 300 people said their lives were changed because they met God. God showed up there. God showed up on the University of Ohio. He showed up at the University of Texas. He showed up at the University of Alabama. He showed up at high schools across the country. Even in our own area, God has shown up in some of our high schools. Amen. I remember coming home from, from an activity and driving into my, into my area. On the front, in the front yard was a group of young girls, about 10 of them. Pretty obvious what they were doing. In the front yard of one of their homes, they gathered in a circle holding hands, and they were praying. God showed up in some campus. And those students are affected. Maybe, maybe it showed up here in Viner. Maybe things are happening here. But the point I'm trying to, to make is we should never, under any circumstances, be discouraged by all the chaos that we see. We need to remember that we have a God who is active in our life. He Amen. shows up wherever we are and whatever circumstances we're in. He showed up in the living room of my home when I was nine years old and said, I want you to be my child. You remember when he showed up in your life? Were you at camp? Were you at home? Were you at a vacation Bible school? You see, and the, the good thing about it is, every time we meet, God shows up. That's right. As a matter of fact, I've heard a lot of times people pray, Lord, you know, we welcome you into this place. We invite you to this place. He's already here, folks. That's right. He, he's invited us. You see, he is the audience. We worship him. But he's here. And when he shows up here, as in other places, we're, we, we have that wonderful potential of experiencing great change in our life. Hope, courage, knowledge, a spiritual renewal. These are things that God does on a very regular basis as we come to worship Him every every Sunday. We don't have to ask Him to be here. He's here. He said, "We're two or three are gathered. I'm here." Amen. I've invited you to come. I saw on the schedule you're going to have the Lord's Supper. That's His table. He's invited you to His table. To eat and uh, uh, eat the bread and drink the juice, remembering his death and burial and his resurrection. It's how the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all of our sins. These are things God is showing up, shows up every time we meet. What a wonderful thought to know that we get to meet God together. That's right. Sadly, a lot of folks have lost the wonder of that. I mean, think about it. Think about how insignificant we are as a person on this insignificant planet in the universe that once you get outside of the Milky Way, you can't even see it. And that insignificant planet that we live on insignificant individuals that we are, God showed up 
and did something that we could not do for ourselves. He changed us. He made us his children. He gave us a home in heaven. He has forgiven us of our sins. He has cleansed us from our sins in such a way that he doesn't even remember when we have, when we ask for forgiveness, he wipes them from his memory. Now, dear friend, I don't know how that's even possible. My wife remembers everything. <laughs> and I'm, I, I have, we have a God that forgets, that forgets our sin. Isn't that amazing? Covers them with the blood of Jesus. And then, but him showing up, him showing up means that he's here for us. He knows what we need. I read a story recently about a young woman who was part of an elite uh, anti-terrorism uh, squad. She was the only woman in a group of men, but she was tough as nails. She was uh, well-trained, lots of skills, and uh, she and her, her squad were on a top secret mission. And something happened where they were exposed and compromised. They were attacked and she was captured. She was captured. The, her team chose to stay behind to try to find where she was. And they did. They found out where she was and through just great effort and strategy, and this overpowering strength, they, they went into the place where she was being held captive and they, they rescued her. She was bloody and beaten, broken arm, and she was in just really bad shape. They got her and they brought her out and they, the, the, uh, the team rescued her and they, they, they brought in other groups to, to, to take the team out and she was part of that. They, they eventually got her to the ship that they were supposed to be on. They put her in the hospital. They treated her best they could. Then they flew her to Germany where she could be taken care of. On any mission like that, and if anybody's been in the military and they do some kind of hard mission like that, there's generally a debriefing. And this young woman was debriefed, and, and part of her debriefing meant she had to speak to a psychiatrist, but she didn't like that. She was tough. She didn't need a psychiatrist. But the psychiatrist, under, he worked with people like that. So he started talking to her. They, he just very casually talked to her. And one day, he, she surprised him. She said, she said, whenever I was captured, I knew I was going to probably die. But I, I was prepared for that. I was, I was trained for that. I, I knew pretty much what was going to happen. And I was ready to die. She said, what I wasn't ready for was for my team to come get me. She said, that's the first time that's ever happened in my life. When I was growing up as a young girl, you know, I would go on a date. My date would be bad. I'd call my dad. He would say, you chose that and you just make it work. Or my car would break down and he wouldn't come get me. So all my life, I never had anybody come get me. And she said, I didn't, I don't know how to handle that. Well, dear friend, God came to get me. That's right. He came to get you. I don't know where you were. I don't know what you were doing. But he showed up to get you and to give you what we couldn't give to ourselves. So here we are. We are people who understand that we live in the presence of God, and that we are people who understand that God isn't passive, he's active. He's active in everything we see going on. It may not be reported, it may not be, re be on the front headlines of newspapers, but it's in the minds and the hearts of every student who has now been changed by the power of God, it's in the minds and the heart of every church that has ever experienced a revival of a move of God in such a great way. We know these things. We are witnesses to the fact that when Jesus shows up, things are really, really changed. Now, 
in this past year or two, we have a group of folks, uh, left wing, you can call them woke individuals. I don't know, never understood where that came from, but they're far from being woke. But anyway, this group got a lot of power over after George Floyd's death. They began to make all kinds of demands, and all kinds of strange demands. They ranged from defunding the police, changing the names of schools, tearing down historical monuments, defacing monuments of founding fathers. This is what they did. And so they, they made other demands, that there were things that needed to be changed because they were either racist or they were not politically correct. And so they went through this whole list of things that needed to be changed. Now, I'm still trying to figure out how these changes made our community better. Still trying to figure that out. For instance, Aunt Jemima's pancake mix name was changed because it was supposed to be racist. Well, they changed the name, but when you open the box, guess what? It's still pancake mix. That didn't change at all. And we find Miss Bertha Ward, sir. Still syrup, Eskimo pie, still ice cream. Uncle Ben's rice, still rice. Changing the name of a product doesn't change the product. But when Jesus changes your name, it's really changed. Amen. We are not the same as we were before we met him. We were dead in sin. Now we're alive. We were blind. But now we see. We were lost, but now we're found. We were sinners new for hell, but now we're saints on our way to heaven. Isn't that, isn't, isn't that good for your wife to know she's living with a saint? Yeah. <laughs> Remind her of that at least once. <laughs> but we're saints of God. That's right. That's what He made us to be. We are new creatures in Christ. Everything about us is different. So when God shows up, like he did on the day of Pentecost, we're not the same. When he showed up as a nine-year-old boy in my house, my life changed. And when he showed up at a missions conference at First Baptist Church in Lake Charles when I was 14 years old, my life changed when he called me to preach. You see, when, when Jesus makes a change, it's real. That's right. Israel. And guess what? The best thing about it is it can't be unchanged. Amen. You can't become a child of God and then become un, un, un a child of God. I hope that's a word about it. But anyway, you can't, you can't change that. You are what you are. And you're going to be a child of God forever in spite of all our sinfulness, our failures, our shortcomings. I saw a post on Facebook one time, aren't you glad that God took into consideration our stupidity before he saved us? <laughs> he does that. But our stupidity doesn't change us who we are. God showed up in your life. You were not the same. And as God moves in your life, you will never be the same again because you're becoming more and more like Jesus. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit being in our hearts is to make us more like Jesus. So, let's not be discouraged by what we see because God is still on the throne and he's still very active in what's going on. That's right. Let us not be discouraged by the things we see because God is not surprised by what's happening. Nothing ever catches him off guard. Amen. He's way ahead of us on all the things that he's determined to do. Let us not be discouraged if things are hard for us and our families because God is right there with us. He shows up with us to help us, to guide us, strengthen us, protect us, give us wisdom. Let us not be discouraged if there's a sin that sticks in our mind that we can't stop thinking about. Let us just have the Holy Spirit remind us that God doesn't remember that sin. He doesn't remember that. I don't know why he does it. I'm just thankful that he does. Amen. I'm just thankful that I don't have to do anything different except to just believe in him. And my life has changed. God show, is showing up. 
He's still showing up. And he's going to show up here every week when you come to worship. Amen. As he waits on us. I hope that he's shown up in your life. I hope that you know him as your own personal Savior. I hope you know the reality of the power of change that he gives to you whenever you believe in him as Savior. He can do that. Don't ever, don't ever let anybody say to you, oh, God can't do anything with your life. He sure can. He can make your old life disappear and give you a new life that you get to discover every day for the rest of your life. That's what being a Christian is all about. Discovering what God is doing with us every day. I hope you know the reality of that. Let's pray together.